The first one is there's a content surplus everywhere, media everywhere, devices everywhere. In fact, when my, my daughter turned 11, she had a sleepover with 10 girls in my house. And um, it was really quiet downstairs. I was kind of confused. And when I went downstairs to see what was going on, they were all in the living room looking down at their devices, texting. Um, if you go to a restaurant, same thing, right? Everybody's looking down. So there's a content surplus. And if you combine that with the fact that there's an attention deficit, um, we as, as customers, we can only consume a finite amount of content. So we put up filters. And the reason why I put up filters is because we only want to consume the content that's relevant to us at a given time. So in, when I was in the process of refinancing six years ago, I would drive down 101 and I would see Quicken Loans and I would hear it on the radio and I would see status updates about interest rates. And the minute that I refinanced my home, all those ads went away. But they really didn't go away. My filters just went up again. So we, there's, a, there's a content surplus, there's an attention deficit, and our lives are unpredictable, meaning um, every day we kind of navigate through life differently. We're checking text messages, emails, we're, we're checking our notifications in Facebook, Twitter, emails. So um, it's really hard for brands to reach your target consumer for those three reasons, content, attention, and unpredictable. Um, so as you think about my, my feedback to many of my clients and just in all openness, StubHub and, and PayPal are our clients of ours, um, as is HP, um, we, we typically say there needs to be a, a kind of an integrated approach. We call it converged media when talking with consumers because the consumer in the upper left and right hand corner needs to hear and interact or see a piece of content three to five times before they believe it. So they're going to see a status update, they might see an RSS feed, they need to see some outdoor advertising, that's still important, they're going to need to see search when they Google it. Um, so all that is to tell a consistent story. Okay? Um, and the last piece is everyone is influential. So regardless of clock score or cred score or peer index score or whatever list you're on, everyone is influential. Uh, I don't fly a certain airline because of a friend who had a negative experience. I'm not going to mention the name, but how many times have we been influenced to, to purchase something or not purchase something based on one person and a conversation that you may have had in a car or on Facebook or what have you? Okay? So, uh, content surplus, attention deficit, consumers are not predictable, everyone's influential, yet our business objectives as marketers and communicators remains the same. Right? We still have acquisition goals. We still have fan growth goals, if that's a, a KPI. We still have revenue goals. We still have market share goals. We still have all that stuff that we're held, to, uh, held accountable for. Which means that the market, external marketplace isn't going to change for us. We need to adapt. We need to change the way that we think about marketing, the way that we think about content, community management, customer service, and converge media. And the way that we do that, and this is what I focus on, is um, social business strategy. Now what social business strategy is, is, is really um, kind of thinking about things holistically and, and, and internally. So when I worked at Intel and we were first building our center of excellence, we did an audit of everything that we were doing externally. And we found that we had 180 or about 185 Facebook pages. And it took literally nine months to just find out who owned these, these pages. In an organization where there's over 100,000 employees, it's difficult to navigate. It's difficult to get things done quickly. Um, and social business helps you achieve that. So the way that we describe that is, and I'll just read it quickly, it helps evolve the thinking and preparedness of an organization bridging what you're doing internally with what you're doing externally um, in social, resulting in collaborative connections, processes, and shared value for all stakeholders. And shared value is something that's really important, close to my heart, um, and this is the way we look at, at shared value. Um, if, if your brand is in the middle, where it says social business, let's focus on the left, on the right, first, in the dark gray. Um, customers drive value to your business by what? Looking at number one, sales and revenue, right? They also um, drive value when they indirectly sell your products and service through advocacy or, or brand advocates. Um, they're also providing feedback. So there's a one-way value chain from externally, from customers, back to your business. And the way that you close that loop is simply by looking at number two, right? It's what we're all doing today. It's community engagement. It's providing content that's relevant. Um, it's, and that results in customer satisfaction, customer support as well. So that, that kind of closes the loop on your external value. The way that you do it internally is number three. Um, I talked about the center of excellence. And I know Lissandra is here. I know that very, I'm not sure if she's still on that center of excellence team, but she was at one point. And they're kind of responsible for driving collaboration within the organization, right? Getting employees involved knowledge sharing, enabling employees to create content and engage with customers. Employees are trusted more than marketers are. It's a fact. They don't, people, marketers don't trust us, but they trust engineers and product managers 
the people who are building these programs. So that, that is a one-way value of proposition with employees. And the way that it, it circles back is process improvement. Quick story, I was talking with an executive from Whole Foods, and he said, hey, we're growing, we're growing, we're not ready to make any more investments here in the, in the Bay Area, but we're, we've hired a Six Sigma expert to figure out how we can drive people through the checkout lines faster because our lines are going all the way to the back of the store. And I said, and I said, oh, you've hired a Six Sigma expert. I said, oh, cool. I go, did you think about, are you talking to the employees, the cashiers? And he was like, oh, that's a really good idea. So when you involve <laughs> employees, the result is process improvement. Um, product innovation. Anyone here a um, Amazon Prime subscriber? That was an employee idea. 20% of revenues come from Amazon, uh, of Amazon, billion dollar company is from Amazon Prime. Okay, employee idea. The, set, the last piece is employee advocacy. And, and so by what Lissandra was saying earlier, is by empowering employees to engage, you create advocacy, right? Again, employees are trusted, subject matter experts are trusted, way up here, academia is trusted, CEOs are not trusted. So there's a scale. So it's called the Edelman Trust Barometer. You can check it out. Um, and, it, and it tells you, it's, it's a global study that measures the level of trust that people have in, in certain institutions and media. So that is the stakeholder value ecosystem. Um, as you think about social business, this is kind of what we all do in the upper left, what we do really well, right? Community management, customer service. I'm talking really fast, aren't I? Let me slow down. Okay. I'm like, I normally give this speech in like an hour, but I know I have 25 minutes. Um, but in the upper left hand corner is what we do really well as marketers and communicators, right? Or customer service people. Community management, marketing, etc. Um, the bottom right, I don't know if you can see the gray, but there's two arrows there. Um, that is kind of the internal dynamics, right? So that is the infrastructure. That is building the process. That is building, that's investing in the right technology. Um, when we think about social businesses, it's, it's people, process, and technology. So in order to see actual true business results, um, you need to make sure that your, your social business infrastructure is enabling your brand, your, the, the, what you're doing as a brand. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about brands becoming media companies, right? So in order to make that transition, you need a, a very focused social business strategy which can help you get there. So when you swing, let me give you a quick example. Working at Intel very early on, 2008, um, we, we had corporate communications um, managing the Twitter account. And whenever somebody would respond with, from customer support, we didn't have any workflows whatsoever. We didn't know who was even was in customer. We didn't even know where customer support was located. Um, so we were kind of at a, at a craze because people would, would say, hey, I'm having a problem with my driver or my HP won't work. Is it the processor or is it the hard drive or what is it? We had no process and no collaborative infrastructure built so that we can take that conversation, assign it to somebody in customer support so that they can solve the customer problem. Right? When you have all that to align, and there's more, more than that, training is obviously important, uh, social media policies, things like that. All of that enables better content, smarter marketing, and more effective relationships. So, um, some tactical considerations. Here's where it gets really good, hopefully. Um, as I think, before anything, I think you know, we need to be very focused on our content. Right? What is our narrative? What is the story that we want to tell consumers? And when I think about that, I think of several different inputs. Into. The content narrative is not the same as the brand narrative, right? The brand narrative is what you're doing um, on paid media for the most part, right? It's, it's your core position. What this does is it takes those brand, that, the brand pillars, so looking at kind of what your brand stands for, what is the brand tone of voice, personality, and then it's also looking at the core issues. So what are the non-business issues that are important to your brand? So if you think about Tom's shoes, what is Tom's shoes, what do they represent? Right? Every pair of shoes you buy goes to somebody in need in, a, in another country, even here in the U.S. So that is important to Tom's shoes. So what are you doing from a corporate citizen, citizenship perspective that's important? The third one is the media. How does the media talk about your brand? Not, not from a, from a um, sentiment perspective. I'm talking about when they talk about your product, how do they refer to it? The community. And there's looks like there's some overlap here. When the community talks about you. Not sentiment. Not, I'm not talking about sentiment or engagement. I'm talking about when they actually talk about you either in their, their own blogs or on their own Facebook pages or on Twitter, what is the context of the conversation? Then looking at fan interest. What else are your fans interested in when they're not talking to you or when they're not talking with you? For example, Skype's a client. They're part of Microsoft. And through an audit, we found out that a high percentage of Skype's followers enjoy film and music. So guess what is a part of our content strategy? Film and music. So, um, and then content, so looking at content performance metrics, so what's working, what's not, what top times, days, and 
all that stuff that, from, a, from a data product perspective is working. Search, how do consumers search for your brand, right, or value proposition, right? So if you sell, if you sell PCs like HP, are consumers searching for laptops or notebooks? Maybe both. Maybe when they're searching for notebooks, they're searching for notebooks. So, so that's important to look at. And then support. Like, what are the, the biggest customer support issues that are happening today um, versus tomorrow versus what do you expect to happen? Um, and for those of you, I'm sure we all know this, but YouTube is the number, um, number two search engine. And the number one search term within YouTube are how-to videos. So as you think about from a support perspective, and maybe one channel that you might focus your support in is YouTube, by creating YouTube videos that are how to do this, how to do that, how to reset your, or, or hard reset an iPhone, or hard reset a phone, or what have you, and build and, and capture some of that, that search volume, which decreases the call to the call center. So you take in all of those inputs, and then out you give birth to a, a brand narrative, or a content narrative, excuse me, and then you need to decide, okay, well, where do we want to, where do we want to have these conversations, right? So, this is just, I don't even think this adds up to 100%. Okay, it doesn't. So, but the point is, is that you, you have to like, figure out, okay, when we think about marketing and events, maybe 15% of our content strategy is going to be that, and we're going to have that on Facebook, and Twitter, and Google+, Plus, and YouTube. Right, 40% are customer stories, right? It's highlighting customer success stories or uh, user-generated content. 20% could be customer support. And you know what? We're not going to have customer support issues on Facebook. Um, we might just handle uh, customer support on Twitter, or maybe it's a private community, right? Or maybe it's the application that, that Sprinkler has built into their platform. Um, so you have to figure that out, and then third-party curated content or industry-related content. Um, a lot of some clients are pushed back on this, but it's really important as you think about from a customer perspective, what do they expect? What do they value? It's not all about you or your brand. It's about what do they admire, what's important to them, and is there anything maybe not a competitor, but a third-party report or industry article that's written about the industry that you can share that adds value to the conversation. And then real-time content, we talked about it, uh, Lissandra did, Oreos made a big splash about it. It's been around for years, actually. Um, notice how I put 10% because it, brands can't sit around waiting for the news cycle to create content. They need to create compelling content day in and day out. In fact, I would argue, uh, if you're not blogging once a day, you're, you're, missing, you're missing. You're missing out. You should be blogging once a day. There should be a blog post that goes out every single day. Not, hard, not, not easy to do, though. Um, so you have your, 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 your narrative. You have your platform strategy. So, so you have what you're going to say, how you're going to tell your story, where you're going to tell it. Then um, building your team. right? And this is, doesn't have to be done sequentially. It could be done simultaneously. So here you have a center of excellence. This is um, very close to the team that I was a part of very early on at Intel. And, um, you know, you have your inner circle, which is, could be the social media team, support, digital marketing, brand, I should say brand and creative, regional editors and analytics, and then if you're a large company, perhaps you have regional or country leads, right? You have APAC and EMEA, and they're kind of doing the same thing. And the role of this team really is focused on that infrastructure, training, um, as you, if you think about becoming a media company, perhaps it's kind of your regional editorial team or central editorial team. And this is the way it works within the organization. Working. Here we go. There we go. So um, imagine at the very top where it says strategy and planning. These are traditional siloed organizations, like product marketing, corporate comms, <coughs> marketing operations. Well, the center of excellence is going to be responsible for breaking down those silos through you know co collaboration and change management initiatives, and then deploying training, social policies, technology deployment, content strategy through a variety of different. Um, channel. So think campaigns and initiatives, paid or no media, general community management, customer support. And then they're going to take those insights and then feed them back into the organization. So this is at a very high level how that they would work. It would be different in every organization based on how you're structured. Once you have your team down, assign roles and responsibilities. So there's a lot of ways to do this. So you can have contributors. I mean, I like to bring up Intel because they have a pretty awesome strategy. If you go to the Intel Facebook page, it's a very creative page. They have no agency. That's, that's putting out content there. What they do is they have this huge database of employee user-generated content, or basically, um, as an employee from any job function or region can submit content, it goes through an approval process, and then they have like an internal designer that makes it look pretty and maybe changes up the copy, and they post it. It's very creative content. So um, you may have contributors who are employees, even customers can be contributors. If you've seen the Coca-Cola site or American Express uh, Open Forum, 
a lot of customers are contributing there. Um, and then you can have editors. So, so editors could be based on region. They could be based on, based on channel. So here are regional editors, right? You may have an editor here in South Africa or South America, EMEA, what have you. And they're just responsible for, for taking content from the contributors, sending it back for, you know, to be edited or approving it to post. At Edelman Digital, we have a blog, um, and we do this today. I'm the regional editor for the, the West Coast. And I have several employees on the West Coast who contribute. They send me content through a system. I, I look at it, I make changes, or, I, or not. Then I send it over to the, the community manager who's in Chicago, then it gets set to publish. Right, so you can take whatever model works for you, um, but you're gonna need a technology solution, um, very much like Sprinkler, to kind of manage that. Um, and here's an example of, of the workflow, right? You brainstorm ideas, it contributorized content, it can go to brand, it can go to creative, it can go to uh, some type of editor, it can get sent back, or it can get approved, scheduled to publish, posted to a channel, and then looking at the analytics, you can go back to the team so you know what type of content performs the best um, and create more of that. Um, Real-time creative newsroom, so again, this is the Oreo thing, right? We've been doing this actually for quite some time with Johnny Walker, um, and a few of our, of our brands in New York and the UK. And this is really a process um, to, 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 to identify um, trending topics and deploy teams, creative teams, analysts, and community managers to create real-time content. And when I say real-time, I mean within an hour, right? So for those of you who have really robust um, approval systems where you know, it has to go through a series of approvals and it may take 24 hours, maybe the creative newsroom is not for you at the moment. Um, but if you can build a trust with, with lawyers or what I would do is um, with one client, we basically said, okay, it takes you about a week to respond to a post to, to a lawyer. I said, we're going to build, use an application that says, so that when you get uh, an approval or when you get a, a post to approve, you have 24 hours to approve it. If you don't approve it, it's still going live. So it's almost putting the accountability on them and they respond much faster. So um, this is just a, a quick kind of real-time creative newsroom, um, something that we do at, Inta, uh, at Edelman. Um, and then Converge Media Modeling. So um, the integration of kind of paid, earned, and owned media, right? So if you think uh, Ultimate Group put out a really good um, post, um, white paper not too long ago. But the idea is you create compelling content. It could be visual, it could be planned or unplanned, right, content. Um, and you, you optimize it, you're measuring the performance, and then you kind of set these key uh, KPIs so imagine uh, benchmarks around average engaged users. So for example, if a Facebook post reaches a certain threshold of engagement, then you may consider putting, pushing it to promote, right? And there are some tools that can, that can do this for you automatically. Um, but this is Converge Media. You should know, I'm sure you all know this if you're managing social in some way or another, that you only see or your content in Facebook, only 8 to 10% of your, your, your friends, fans, and followers see your content when it's organic. Right? Sometimes it's 12%. So you can, you can increase your reach through, through pushing content through paid, um, and it's new speed marketing is really what it is. Um, building a real-time listening center. So there's two ways to look at this from a customer service perspective, right? So managing brand mentions or mentions of a product and having the workflows behind the scenes that support that, that responsiveness. Of course, it's monitoring for trends. So identifying what certain topics that your brand is comfortable talking about, like Lissandra said, it has to, there has to be some type of uh, integration with it. A uh, quick example, one of our clients is a um, prepaid mobile service provider called TrackPhone. Now, they sell most of their phones through um, uh, Target and Walmart is their biggest distributor. And um, if you've seen the movie The Call with Halle Berry, anybody see that movie? It just came out. Okay, she had a TrackPhone. Anyway, um, so... We, it was 12, 12, 12. Remember all the Facebook status updates on 12, 12, 12 last year? So very early in the morning, we said, what's going on? The end of the world's not supposed to be until December 21st, not 12, the Mayan calendar thing. Anyway, so 12, 12, 12, we saw, uh, I saw in my feed, all of our feeds, every 12, 12, 12 posts were, tr were trending. So we took out a, our, an iPhone, snapped a picture of a calendar, and we put something on the, on the Facebook page that said, happy 12, 12, 12. Aren't you glad you're not stuck in a 12 month contract? That post alone, garnered probably the most engagement ever because it was relevant. It took probably five minutes to post and, and we, we just called our clients and said, hey, can we post this rather than go through email? And that's one of the highest performing posts and it was just a picture of the calendar. But it was relevant. Um, in that case, it was, it was monitoring kind of trends that are happening, not necessarily about the brand, but where you can capitalize on real-time marketing. And then I'm just almost done. 
investing in the right technology. So thank you, Jeremy. This is a screenshot that you provided to me wow, um, not too long back. Um, but you know, I've evaluated a lot of platforms in here um, in this space. Um, call it social CRM, content publishing. And I will go on the record to say, and I'm not just saying this because you invited me, <laughs> or this because you ranked the highest in the latest report, by the way. You're on video, oh. just making sure. Are you? Are you? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, wow. <laughs> best, enterprise, best enterprise tool available. Um, I recommended it to PayPal, right? And that's kind of the reason why, they're here, why you're here. So, um, but make sure that you, know, you're, you're, you, you build your capabilities and your requirements first, and then go to the vendor and say, this is what I need. Don't say, what are your capabilities, and we'll build our requirements around it. You should be very focused on what you need in your organizations, and then go to the vendor and uh, be prepared to have them either make a, make a promise or a commitment to, to innovate based on what you need, um, or find someone else. And... That was quick. That was the fastest. That was the fastest I know. So here's my email address. Um, if you have questions. Just shoot me a note, or I'll be around for a while um, to answer any questions. I'm local. I'm literally a mile away, so it was great to be here. I just have to hop in. No traffic whatsoever. Um, but if you have any questions now, I'll be open to questions or afterward, wherever we're going, and then via email later. What's the biggest challenge your clients have faced on scaling? So far? Biggest challenge is um, the the increase in in platforms, Vine, Instagram, even. Twitter, multiple Twitter accounts, and having enough content and the right community management and the right scale internally to manage it. Because what usually happens is, give a quick example, I'm not going to mention the name, but a client comes to me about a year and a half ago when Google Plus opened their brand pages. And I said, what's the plan for Google Plus? And I said, well, what's your content strategy? Who's your community manager? What's your moderation policy? And, and, and how are you going to measure success? You know what she said to me when I, after I told her that? Let's wait till the next quarter. <laughs> So I think the point is I think there's so much there's so much innovation happening in the marketplace today that a lot of large brands just want to jump right into the next big thing without having a, a, a concrete story for that. Have you had any brands abandon a channel because of that? They started it and then they yeah, blow yeah. it. Go to Google Plus now. A lot of brands have abandoned, I mean they still have it, but they haven't posted content in months. Right? And I'm not just picking on Google Plus. Um, even like multiple Twitter accounts, right? Twitter account for product launches, I don't recommend. I don't recommend Facebook for product. I don't recommend a new Facebook page and companies are still doing this, especially in other, other regions where they're saying, oh, we're launching a new product in Germany. We need a Facebook page. And they're doing it in a silo. They're not doing it. So there's no context. There's no story. And there's no, there's no strategy behind it. So, and so what's happening is, is that they realize months later that, oh, we have, we've invested this much money. There's no return. What, what happened? So they're asking questions, and it's causing brands to kind of um, Refocus and, 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 and audit and kind of take back some of the channels. I know, you know, there, there was a big initiative here to try to figure out how can we consolidate channels because there were a lot of them to do that. And so I think that's still a main struggle today. And also it's the content. Content is still a huge challenge. There's not enough content to, to, that's engaging and, and still, no offense to, towards like corp com people, but a lot of like PR folks, and I work for PR, an organization, never in PR myself, but, um, but, too many, a lot of PR people still feel that, you know, it's about press releases and messaging. And unfortunately, it's not like that. That's one input, but there's so much more that could be, that could be created and shared. Two things. One, decaf. Highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly is, is, is how, and, and, and maybe the answer is we're already there, but how far away do you think we are from the point at which you know organizations like PR and, and, and uh, brand marketing and product marketing are going to invest in social media fully, and when I mean that, I mean they're they're interested in, in social or they're investing in social media to the point that's actually displacing other traditional forms of media. Like, hey, we're not going to do a TV ad; we're going to take that money and we're just going to focus on a social strategy, or that's going to be the main thrust of our marketing. I don't think it ought to be that, okay. and I think it's okay. I think that this, this transition from brand to media company, whether you agree with it or not, whether you whether you push back on it or not, it has to happen. And when I say media company, I don't mean you need to sell ads on your, on your page, right? That's how media companies make money. What I mean is from a content perspective and the story that you're going to tell, and paid media is just as important as, as earned and owned, right? But this transition and, and, and this idea that social is going to be involved in everything, I think is what's going to happen, right? So now that you're, they're going to start hiring strategists 
that, that report into the, the advertising teams or the you know or the, even the customer support anywhere that you're you're creating content externally, there's going to be some social proficiency needed. I don't think it, I think I don't think companies are ever going to displace what they're doing um, in TV alter, or even traditional media into into social. It wouldn't make sense because there's no you can't scale as quickly and easy as you could in, in traditional media. 